We're back here at NRA headquarters for another installment of the Curator's Corner. I'm here with my friend Phil Schreier, senior curator here at the National Firearms Museum. And Phil, you've done it again. You said, John, what I, I don't, I, I'm not going to tell you anything about the gun. <laughs> you're going to love it. So, Phil, go. What do we have for this installment? Well, John, if you're a collector of Colt percussion arms, uh, do you have a favorite amongst the Colt percussions? A lot of people like the 1860 Army, you know, Clint Eastwood yeah, used right. one in Josie Wales. It's, it's, it's pretty much a classic looking right. revolver. It's got that look. It's got that Western look, look yes. it does. It, it achieves a, 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 just something that it's hard to describe, but it's almost the perfect A je ne sais quoi, if you that will. That would be in French, if those were the words you choose, those would be them. <laughs> but few people really realize the significance and popularity of this little bad boy the 1849 Pocket Colt. Uh, of all the Colt percussion revolvers made, this one outnumbers them all, uh, with over 340,000 of them produced between 1849 and 1873, when they actually stopped making these. Wow. Uh, they were very popular during the Civil War. In fact, uh, the Civil War numbers take you up to about 280,000 or so. Uh, but the real neat thing about this gun is the fact that it's called the 1849 Pocket. Uh, some of our, uh, our listening audience or viewing audience might remember the year 1849 is the year that gold was discovered at Sutter's oh, Mill in yes. California, yes. starting off the great oh. westward expansion <laughs> of the California Gold Rush. Well, you know, the ability, man's always wanted to go to the moon, right? and Jules Verne even wrote about it, uh, but the ability to get there is what kept us on the ground until July of 1969. Uh, same thing with the West. Everybody wanted to go West. The West was an inviting place, but it really took, well, the motivation of getting gold, but the ability to get there was the ability to be able to defend yourself during the journey out there oh, and yeah, once it you was got tough. there. A it lot, was tough. A lot, of, a lot of obstacles, lots of dangers. Lots of dangers. And the ability to manufacture a gun that shot rapidly, this could shoot five. Some models have six, uh, six chambers in them, like this one does, uh, gave uh, the uh, westward, westward pioneer uh, an opportunity to defend himself and, and those that could avail themselves of the Colt Pocket uh, 1849 model. Uh, the, uh, the gun, because it was one of the first items in the history of man to be made completely in a factory with interchangeable parts, meant that the price of it was much lower oh, yeah. than even a, a handmade single shot would have been at the time. Uh, so being able to uh, maneuver themselves, you know, be able to go west, young man, as Horace Greeley once said, uh, a lot of that was made possible uh, by the ability to purchase and take with them five six-shot Model 1849 Colt Pocket Revolver. And just like with technology now, being manufactured in a factory, it made the technology cheaper and more available to more people. Hence, people could get a firearm like this and have it available to them, and which I'm sure had a lot to do, I guess, with the numbers that were sold. That, that's very true. Now, of course, you know, don't get me wrong or misinterpret anything. These were still pretty expensive. Uh, for the average person. Most people went west with a double barrel shotgun. Uh, that was the gun that won the west in reality was an old double barrel. Uh, but if you could afford to have a gun that is going to fire multiple times, this was, uh, this was the gun. And it, it's a very interesting uh, piece. Uh, there were, like I said, there were 340,000 of them made in the 20 plus years that they were manufactured. Uh, Colt actually set up a factory in London and manufactured this gun in mm. London for uh, a number of years, 53 to 57, uh, made 11,000 of them. And because of the fact that it had such a long production run, there are a lot of different variances and modifications made to this gun over those 20 uh, odd years. Uh, Flaterman's Guide to Antique American Firearms and Their Values states that for a collector to adequately get a representative piece of all the different variances in the 49, he'd need to collect about 200 different, oh different guns. Wow. 
Yeah. <laughs> and for a collector, that's 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 what you want to hear. It's something to do. <laughs> Let's get going. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Start scouring those gun shows. So it's a beautiful piece, Phil. Tell us how we can come and see that and at so many other wonderful farms that surround us here at the National Farms Museum. Well, John, uh, this fine cult and a number of others uh, from the cult uh, history are available on public display seven days a week, absolutely free of charge, plenty of parking. Uh, open from 9.30 to 5, and uh, that's right in Fairfax, Virginia, right off the Interstate 66 and Route 50. If you can't visit us on the Interstate, come by on the Internet and take a look. Uh, we've got a wonderful website up, a lot of uh, interactive videos on the collection, every gun in the museum. Uh, you can zoom right in until you mm. s see the initials on the engravers in some of them, and that's at nramuseum.com. Phil, thank you for a wonderful installment of The Curator's Corner. Thank you, John, for having us once again.